grammar is seen as, in some quarters, damaging for children. But you and I have seen that language is even more than just drudgery. It actually has, like we talked about in our last episode, the liberal arts are the, are the kinds of skills that produce good in us. Hey, I'm Shane, and this is the second episode in our little mini-series that we're doing on the liberal arts. And I'm back with my guest, Mitchell Holly. Mitch and I today are talking about grammar. Grammar, of course, is one of the, uh, the arts that we call the trivium. It's the first one in the liberal arts, the trivium, quadrivium. We talked about terms and definitions and gave a total overview in our first episode. If you haven't listened to that, go back, listen to the first episode, get the broad sense of definitions, and then come back here where today we're talking about grammar. So, Mitch, first, I have to relate a story to our listeners from our younger years. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I wasn't confident that Mitch actually ever learned grammar when we were in high school <laughs> because Mitch had a massive, massive library. And whenever he would meet someone, <laughs> you would tell them that you had read every book. Like, they could mention any book, and you'd be like, yeah, I read that. <laughs> and what we determined was that, in reality, you were actually, if you had read the back cover and, like, had a sense of, like, the bylines and yeah. who had written it and, you know, uh, read a synopsis, that was considered read. Right. There's a uh, there's a mythos that surrounds this story that uh, you and, and my brother have, uh, have kind of spun. And... Uh, <laughs> so, at that time, you had not acquired grammar, and but now you have acquired grammar, and you've actually read all of those books. It's quite the transformation. Well, I, I would admit there was probably some immaturity in those younger years <laughs> that uh, hopefully has culminated in the fact that I, I tr I've tried to do the work and read the books. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, that, thank you for bringing that the, the worst the worst side of that uh, to the conversation about it's, uh, yeah keep us humble. So Mitch, when you came back and you decided to finally learn, grammar, start reading books, yes. Yeah. <laughs> What is grammar? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, just on a very basic level, grammar is really the the science of applying a name to things. Yeah, the art, really. Uh, yeah, the, the art. Well, yeah, it, it, it's kind of an art and a science, right? right? You know, so you're you're applying a, a name to things in the world and then learning um, how to put those names together in mm. the context of clauses and just things like that. So it's. Uh, on a very basic level, it's this idea of providing a name to a definition, um, looking at this and saying it's a chair and a mm -hmm. table, <laughs> um, and, but then also being able to take the word chair and table and put them in a sentence. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it, there's, it, it ramps up in terms of complexity. Um, but, on the, but on that, you know, providing everything with a name um, is, a, is a helpful kind of starting point, I'd say. The first step in learning anything is learning the names and the words that are in play. Right, right, right. For every discipline, uh, you're going to find this, right? Mm -hmm. If you, um, um, you know, if you're starting carpentry, starting to learn some carpentry, like, you know, I know that you've picked up a little bit of carpentry, then you have to know what a... Like a rip cut is. What a rip cut is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, most people don't know what a rip cut is, <laughs> you know, or a, like a dove, what is it, a dove seam or whatever uh, in, in the wood where, you know, the, you have to be able, in order to be able to talk about that with other people, uh, in order to be able to determine what you're going to do next, you have to first be able to name it and talk about it. Yeah, that's right. Another way that Martin has always talked about grammar that I find really interesting is he would say that the grammar is a thing as it is symbolized, you know, using kind of metaphysical language. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing as it is symbolized helps you to understand just on a very basic level why someone like Aristotle, for instance, was so consumed with naming and categorizing yeah. Everything, or or someone like Thomas Jefferson, who, for some reason, his entire life he was obsessed with cataloging mm -hmm. everything. He mm -hmm. wrote down the weather every day because he he had a basic sense of the names and the the changes, and and he wanted to catalog it all because that was the beginning of knowledge. Right, and it's it's helpful. It is helpful to uh, from that from that uh, perspective to to remind ourselves that. As as a member of the trivium, mm. grammar is a language skill, mm. 
And language at its very basic level is symbolic, mm -hmm. right? So you're taking a conventional symbol like the word chair and you're saying that that thing in the world is a chair. Right, right. <laughs> and, but that's largely, you know, um, uh, conventional in the sense that, you know, as, as English speakers have got together to say, we're going to call things that exist like this chairs. So the, we're going to have a symbol, a word that's going to represent that thing in the, in, in reality, you know, and, in, and, you know, but another culture is going to have a different symbol, right? So in Greek, it'd be cathedra, right? Sure. Um, so an English symbol chair, uh, Greek cathedra, but both of those, sim both of those are different symbols that kind of point to, um, something different in the world mm. right um and this is where you know language study gets to be really interesting because um you know different language you're going to point you know point in different ways and at in, in in different modes to different things right right um and, and so that's why you know learning more than one language would be helpful yeah sure so in our curriculum then where does grammar show up in classical education curriculum yeah i mean it shows up in a lot of places, right? <laughs> Especially in the grammar school years, right? With uh, reading, writing, phonics, spelling, um, and but we we do a lot of that work, um, you know, in kindergarten through and through you know second grade, we're doing those you know kind of phonics, spelling. Right. Uh, so I mean, that's all they're doing, basically. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. That's the the most important things that they're doing. Um, then after that, we start the study of Latin. Right. And then in Latin, Latin then becomes the time tested tool for kind of instilling those grammatical categories mm. um, and not just the names of things. Right. But also grammar as a putting the names of things together. So, mm -hmm. you know, what we would typically think about grammar, you know, subject verb agreement, uh, you know, the fact that in Latin, um, the same noun, depending on its ending, could function differently. You know, the function of nouns in, 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 a, in the context of clauses and sentences. So, um, yeah, the very early years, we're doing those hard works of phonics and, 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 and reading and spelling. Um, but then that eventually gets to that sort of time-tested vehicle for grammatical instruction right. being Latin. Yeah, so the trivium, you know, in our curriculum is anchored to specific classes, Latin. Yep. Reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, phon not arithmetic, but reading, writing, phonics in kindergarten through second grade, Latin in third grade. But like you said, it's also in each of our subjects. Anytime you're acquiring knowledge, you're using these language art skills that is... Grammar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, I mean, in, in, even in the upper years when you're not in a Latin class, which you should be, right? But even if you're not, um, you know, like it, it goes back to the example of like carpentry. If you're going to be good at the skill of carpentry, which is a manual skill, not a liberal skill, um, then, you know, you're going to need to know the, the vocabulary uh, to be able to talk about it well. Um, you know, you got to rivet something. That's a verb. Right. But it, you can also have a rivet joint. So now it's a noun. Right. Um, it, you know, and every subject is going to be like that, whether you're studying history, you're going to have to learn, um, you know, the different time periods like the golden age of, of Rome or whatever. And what that's referring to concretely and in, in the world and in, in history, um, if you're going to study theology. Right. You're going to have to study, you know, have to learn what the hypostatic union is <laughs> and uh, right. what what is the word hypostatic hypostasis mean? Sure. Um, you know, or homoousia. Right. You know, right. Or home, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, you have to learn this so that, you know, whatever subject, there's going to be a whole host of definitions and ways of of talking. that kind of go with that, that, right. uh, that science. Right. And in, in the modern educational movement, a lot of the damage has come from neglecting thorough mastery based approaches towards grammar. We grammar is seen as in some quarters damaging for children to, to make them learn, to, to encourage students to, to motivate them to learn grammar is seen as laborious as drudgery, mm -hmm. but you and I, we, we both love language. So mm -hmm. that's a part of it. But you and I have seen that language is even more than just drudgery. It actually has, like we talked about in our last episode, the liberal arts are the, are the kinds of skills that produce good in us. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about that a lot together over the years. Reflect a little bit on the ways that, that grammar itself has, has meant more than just mastering a set of facts. Yeah. So, I mean, grammar is, um, you know, a little bit of my background is, cognitive linguistics right so 
and in and in that that world, one of the one of the great philosophers uh, of language, like uh, von Humboldt, who's a German guy, um, talks about this. Um, there's a, a a yearning inside every soul to accompany every feeling with a noun, mm. right? Um, so th- there's a piece to you can't to our own thinking, to our own emotion that you can't really have experience without. Um, a language that describes that, right? Mm. So you can't just have arbitrary thoughts that exist outside of language. All of your thinking must be is is must take place inside a language, mm. right? So therefore, if you have not done the difficult and hard and arduous work of studying definitions and grammar, um, then you won't be a good thinker. Mm. Um, and that is cross discipline. Right. right. So you have to, especially in early years, you have to spend a good amount of time develop, developing words, learning how to spell those words, you know, being able to put make compound complex sentences, you right. know, right. and learning what a subordinate clause is. And so so that you can think well about anything. Grammar is so foundational. I mean, so this is just a basic point in um, in um, in the field of linguistics. Right. You you can't. Um, language allows you to see kind of reflexively um, as you acquire more language you can see reflexively things that you didn't see before Mm. so like a great example of this would be um, you know at first you might not know what how would you describe like all the different flavors of being happy right? Right, or all the different flavors of of um, you know being being sad well if at first you didn't understand you know um, there's a great poem that that goes something like, you know, happiness is a bird that sits on that, you know, sits on my shoulder and sings me a tune all the time. And so there's something to that, to describing happiness that way uh, in terms of definition that kind of, oh, happiness is kind of this, it's this thing that, that lifts me up, right? right, right. Uh, and there's a real tangible example to that. So language and our growth in language and our, and our development in language helps us to see reflexively things that we've didn't quite understand in the past, but now we understand because we've grown in our language. We're able to describe it and name it and talk about it. Um, but it also helps us move forward as we develop more complex thoughts, right? And then it also helps us digest complex ideas. Whenever you can take a complex idea and you can begin to put it into your own words mm. and parse it out and and put it in a clause where there's a subordinate clause that's, you know, kind of proving this, you know, right? So there's... Um, there's a real foundational um, a role that grammar has to play mm. um, at all levels of education. Um, and it is vitally important that we shore up some of those foundational skills uh, of grammar um, in, in the early years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one point that's been really helpful for me over the years is thinking about the ways that poetry, and, and of course, like we've said at the beginning, the liberal arts all bleed into each other. They're all the tools of, of knowledge. And, and um, But poetry illustrates that point that you were making, that, that language gives us an ability to perceive that we wouldn't have without it. And so, for instance, there's a ton of poetic language in the Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, the Lord is my shepherd. It's impossible to really accurately translate that into English mm-hmm. because it's not... A, it's not necessarily just a word, it's an image. Mm-hmm. It is a, a, a perceived relationship, the way that a shepherd cares for a sheep. And so, of course, that bleeds into rhetoric a little bit, but the basic concept is that in grammar, there are terms that are evoking a certain reality. That is the relationship a shepherd has to a sheep that we cannot understand unless we know that name, unless yeah. we've experienced that name, because we are embodied creatures that that have experiences and we need names for those experiences. So I, I like your example of being happy. You know, yeah. happy and ecstatic are different. Right, right. They're, but you need the name ecstatic to understand the difference. That's right. That's right. And by acquiring more definitions, the, you know, the more articulate you can be both with your thinking mm. and and expressing, you know, how you're feeling or, or what you've experienced in the world. Like, you know, so the shepherd illustration, you know, if at first you thought that you understood kind of the nurturing, caring, um, demeanor and character of of God. As soon as you label him with the metaphor of a shepherd, then now you're like, oh, it makes sense now. Right, yes, right. in the same way that a shepherd 
cares for his flock and will go out and will find a lost sheep and will bring that sheep back to the fold. Um, you know, that's, that's the relationship that God has to his people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it helps, you know, by uh, being able to attach shepherd, a symbol, a linguistic sim- symbol, and use that linguistic symbol as a metaphor for God's relationship to us. Mm-hmm. Now we can see, oh, okay, I have a whole grammar now to talk about the nurturing and care of, of, of the Father. So in uh, Memoria Press's curriculum specifically, but in classical education more broadly, we start studying Latin in third grade, uh, actually second grade, but then really in earnest uh, in fifth grade, and, and they go all the way till the senior year of high school studying Latin. And frankly, that's probably the thing that most people are confused by or critical of in our curriculum, but yet our our commitment to it is tied to our commitment to the liberal arts. So could you defend a little bit of why we study Latin um, in our curriculum, why it's important and why, especially in relationship to grammar? Yeah, I mean, so Latin is, I mean, I think I mentioned this before, but Latin is just the time-tested tool for uh, instilling grammatical competency uh, into our students. You know, so it's very hard for native speakers to analyze their own language, right? As a native speaker, mm. you know, there's there's a couple of reasons. Well, let me put it this way. There's a couple of reasons why English is it's bad. It, it, it's not bad to study English, but it can be difficult to, to learn grammatical competency from the study of English. One, English is highly irregular, mm. right? So, uh, you know, there's a lot of weird peculiarities about, right. <laughs> about English. And... Um, the other thing, though, is that, um, um, and, you know, Latin is is highly regular, right? And so by looking at another, a, a language that has a clear, very clear grid structure to it, right, right. right, then you're able, by looking at that, by studying that grid, right, by studying how clear um, the distinctions are, uh, by learning how sentences in Latin are put together, and learning how um, the you know a clause functions, and learning how verbs function, uh, by looking at it in a very clear kind of black and white um, language like Latin, um, you're able to then use Latin as kind of a lens through which you can see English better, right? Because as a native speaker, like I was trying to say before, there's there's things about English that you know, but you don't know that you know, <laughs> right? Right? Like a, a third grader can use adjectives without knowing what an adjective is, right, <laughs> you know, right. you know, and he can, he can, uh, uh, you know, a, a third grader or, you know, a, a young kid, you've probably heard a young kid walking around saying something like, um, they, they learn run or they learned walk, walked, and then they, they go to run and they say, well, run, run. Right. <laughs> right. And then eventually over time, you may not even ever have to teach that student that, okay, it's not run, run, it's run, ran. Uh, they'll probably just get that. Uh, just by being in an English environment where they're imitating other speakers. And so there are things, you know, without learning the difference between a weak verb and a strong verb, mm-hmm. like that English has, um, they're able to just, with competency, make the, make a distinction between run and run. Well, in, in Latin, um, y- in order to know grammar, you have to learn it explicitly. You're not mm-hmm. learning it implicitly just by being around it. And so by studying Latin, you're being forced to do the hard work of making grammar concepts explicit. Right. Uh, whereas a native speaker, sometimes those explicit rules can be hidden by the fact that we, we know them intuitively. Sure. Um, you know, but again, I just want to go back to the reason why it's so important for us is because it really has been the time-tested tool. I mean, it provides a very clear kind of, and I go back to that grid structure, right? right? I mean, just think about the verbal system, you know, and how all the endings fit together in a very rigid kind of uh, structural way. Um, by learning that rigid structure of a very different language than English, but also similar enough, um, then you're able to then take that grid that you're learning, that that linguistic grammatical grid, and then look back reflexively on English and say, oh, I can see, through this lens, through this Latin lens, I can see English better. I think it's really helpful to kind of zero in on that that grid. You know, you're drawing this mental image that if anyone has learned a second language, then they can also see that. But if you haven't, you might not because most English students growing up don't learn or write out, I eat, you eat, he eats, we yeah. eat, you all eat, they eat, yeah. which could also be, I might eat, you might eat, he might eat. 
Yeah. Not eats, but he might eat. Yeah. Um, you know, it, so in the subjunctive in English, we don't we don't cha- change the third person singular, but it, in yeah. Latin, you have these charts: amo, amas, amat, and you know that that is that box represents <laughs> a number of different grammatical uh, terms. You know, present, active, indicative, yeah. and having that structure where each word rec- uh, represents so many different important grammatical ideas, then begins to structure. Coming back to what we were talking about before, the way you even perceive reality. Now you are not just thinking when you say the word eat about that semantic idea of eating something. When you use the, a word that means eat in Latin mm-hmm. in whatever conjugation it's in, you now are clearly conceiving the point of view. Is this first, second, third person? Right. The tense, the aspect. Right. Uh, the the mo- the mood. Uh, you know whether it's it's concrete, it's whether it's real or, or fictitious. All of these different concepts start to come with it, and the student's mind is structured in a way that it it never is. If all you learn is English, and if in English you never get past the implicit knowledge that most students have. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's why most, I mean, pretty much everyone who learns another language will say, I understood English grammar so much more when I took French. Right. (laughs) right. Or I I understand English grammar so much more when I took German or whatever. Um, and the reality is that's probably true. You know, yeah, they probably yeah. do genuinely understand English grammar as a result of having French. But what has been, uh, you know, but this is why it might be helpful just to distinguish like the study of French from the study of, of Latin. You know, what has been the time tested tool um, that is, you know, highly rigid, that is, um, um, that is, you know, the most students have benefited from in the history of education. And that, that's been the study of Latin. It's not until recently where Latin was kind of take, taken away uh, from the classroom. Um, um, and, and so it has such a central role to play um, in, in an education from, in our case, second grade through, through senior year. So personally for you, what was your experience learning Greek? I mean, that's, I think, for both of us who, who were, our education became more, more solid later, later on. You loved yeah. learning Greek, just, just personally, I know you spent a ton of time. You're teaching your infant child Greek. Yeah. <laughs> Just talk to me about what it's meant to you and why you would encourage others to start with Latin, but then also move to Greek. Yeah. So let me just a little bit of a background. Um, you know, started Greek in eighth grade um, and, you know, eighth, ninth, tenth. And then, um, you know, did four years in college as my minor and then uh, did and two master's degrees where Greek was the central, uh, central. Just one master's degree wasn't enough. Uh, It should have been. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, So, uh, you know, anyway, um, that's a little bit of my background, right? So I spent a lot of time studying Greek grammar and, um, you know, it does have such a central role to play in, in, um, in early years. But I think probably, first of all, it's always been the case that Latin has been the first language that right. a student would study. Um, you know, how the schools that I went to didn't offer Latin. Um, so I took the next best thing, I suppose. But um, th- it can be very difficult for a seventh or eighth grader, to, you know, much less a student that's younger than that, um, to just jump into the study of Greek. I mean, Greek uses a different alphabet. Um, it's not as systematic. And it is, um, there's a lot of peculiarity. I mean, take the, <laughs> there's a lot of peculiarities to right, it. Right. Um, whereas Latin, I mean, there's a, it, it, it tends to be the natural step after you learn phonics mm. and after you're able to, to, you know, sound out words and begin to read and start spelling, then Latin is the perfect next step. Um, and the reason for that is because you're not learning a new alphabet. Mm. Latin uses the same alphabet that English uses. Um, and so there's not that, you know, learning a new script like there is with Greek, that, that's definitely a barrier. Um, a lot of the words sound very similar um, to sounds that we have in English, where in Greek, you know, there's some weird consonant clusters mm. and things. And even the vowels can be a little difficult sometimes if you're going to be like it right down to it. Um, and so Latin Latin is just a gentler and, and probably, um, you know, more helpful for English, sure. for English speakers, right? So, you know, like 70 percent of our vocabulary um, is Greek, like in terms of our common vocabulary, or sorry, Latin. Um, That's exactly right, Latin. Um, Now, some of our scientific terminology is largely Greek, right? Scientific 
Uh, you know, so when you get into the sciences and you're learning about the names of infections and uh, the different parts of infections for like the infections in the body, things like that, that's largely Greek vocabulary. But, you know, most students don't need to learn that, you know, yeah, unless you go yeah. to med school or something like that. Um, but it, for English speakers, I mean, you know, 70 percent, 80 percent of your voc of our vocabulary are just Latin words. Right. Um, you know, so learning Latin grammar, which is very similar to English grammar. Um, and then learning um, Latin vocabulary is a huge help for English speakers. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would be great to go on then and study um, study Greek for a number of reasons. One is that um, most, if you're going to study philosophy, it, you cannot avoid Greek words. Yeah. I mean, the Greeks, because they spent so much time in philosophy, the Greeks were mainly about philosophical thinking, the Latins about philosophical doing. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> you know, so the Romans did a lot, yeah. the Greeks thought a lot. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so as a result, the Greeks have made a lot of distinctions. They've named a lot of things in the world. They've yeah. spent a lot of time um, providing a vocabulary for philosophy and for literature analysis, for literary criticism, etc. So you know, for those of us who you know who you know who've mastered Latin. A great next step would be the mat to, to work on Greek yeah. because so much of that highly technical, um, you know, uh, fields in the humanities really do rely on um, a Greek vocabulary. You might say that the learning Greek first is like learning to play the electric guitar before you learn to play the piano. Like it's exciting. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's flexible. Yeah. It's dynamic. Yeah, but you need the music theory. You need the, all the keys. Yeah, you, you need know? to start at the very beginning. You need to understand there's one, you know, there's one note for one key. And um, yeah, I, it's, I, you would know more about music theory than I did, given our <laughs> backgrounds. Um, uh, just, but I, I, I think the analogy holds. All right. Well, that was our second episode on grammar. Uh, an overview, talked about Latin, appreciate it. Next time, we'll be talking about logic.